All right, I want you to turn to Jeremiah 29. Now, um, I want to take a look at a, just like last week, I took a look at a beautiful, beautiful passage of Scripture, in my view, Ezekiel 36. I want to do the same with Jeremiah um, 30 and 31 and just see how far we get into this, because I've been thinking about this all week long. And I want you to start, though, in Jeremiah 29 with a very familiar verse. Most people just love it. I see it even on cards and things like that. And I see why. It's one of the most beautiful verses. But I wonder if everyone understands the, con, uh, the context of it. Jeremiah 29, 11. I'll bet you anything you've seen this. I know the thoughts I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Isn't that beautiful? I know the thoughts I have toward you. Just say I did it. God thinks toward us. Okay. He says, then you'll call upon me and you'll go and pray unto me and I will hearken unto you. And you will seek me and find me when you will search for me with all your heart. There Jeremiah is quoting Moses, Deuteronomy 4, who predicted the end of the world. He said, at the end of the world, the Jews are going to be so far from God, you can't get any more farther from them, from God. And they'll be in such distress and such trouble and such tribulation. But then Moses gave them a promise and I believe they'll take him up on it. If you, then you will seek me, you turn to me and seek me. And if you seek me with all your heart, you will find me. Now look, I talk a lot about the Jews because I've been doing the Old Testament on Wednesday night. But, you know, the Jews are just a microcosm of the human race. The Jews are like this sample that we all, what we are. Never, never condemn the Jews. I look at the Jews and all, their laundry is on display for everyone to see. I mean, it's just out there and it's ugly. It's not pretty. It's very ugly. And then I realized something, you know, thank God that that's not me. But, you know, it, 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 is, it is me, but it's not me on display. You know what I'm saying? Like if they did, if their scriptures was written about the life of Bill, I wouldn't fare much better than the Jews. I mean, we, we just can't fathom we just cannot fathom sometimes when we read the Old Testament. How, why, don't, why don't you see this? How far are you going to go from God? Or how is it that so soon after a powerful deliverance, you have gone into apostasy? But look at, look at America and the church in America. Oh my goodness, could you ever have imagined? I began my Christian life in the late 1970s. And I suppose the old timers then thought it was already really very apostate, but it was some beautiful thing that I saw in the church and the life of the church. And I, I always see it because I always find it. It's always going to be there. But I couldn't have imagined the mega church and the complete red, redefinition of church and, in my view, the complete de deconstruction of church from some organic life that we can all have together that's ordained by Jesus into some big corporate, I don't even know what it is, computerized, consumerized monstrosity, really. It's far, far, far removed from church. Anyway, I got off my topic. Okay, look, Jeremiah, this is a beautiful passage. Now, here's the context, though. It's part of a letter. Jeremiah, the prophet, let me give background, uh, was the prophet during the time of the last kings of Judah. The last kings of Judah. And you could say the last days of Judah. The model for the last days, according to Jesus and the apostles, they draw very heavily from the last days of Judah. The last kings of Judah. Now, you remember, the kings of Judah, that accord, ever since King David, the kings of Judah are sons of David, and they uh, are called sons of God. They're supposed to be the sons of God. God said, I'll make your sons like my sons. I will adopt you. And if they, if they go astray, I will punish them like a father. Well, these kings just kept getting worse and worse and worse and worse. Now, there was one shining light. And he might have been the third greatest king of Judah after David. Um, and perhaps Hezekiah, whose name was Josiah. Now, I'm going to give a lot of background, so I don't even know if I'll even get very far into my text. But look, I, I'm just going to go with the flow, okay? Josiah, 
lived in a time of such decline that you already lost 10 of the 12 tribes of Israel. Gone. Just taken out. Now, if you think about that, like think about that in the big picture. How many true religions are on the earth? One. <laughs> and who represents them? 12 tribes. But because of apostasy, 12 tribes becomes two tribes. What? They're gone. They would not repent, even in spite of Elijah and Elisha. Anyway, they're gone. And these kings of Judah are bad. But Josiah one day orders the remodeling of the temple because his grandfathers and fathers had done all kinds of crazy things in the temple, like set up pagan altars and brought, brought in false gods and everything like that. And he ordered the financing, financing and remodeling of the temple. And they're carrying out this remodeling. And I don't know, they moved a shelf or something like that. And they see a book. What's that? I don't know. I've never seen it before. They read it. It's the book of Deuteronomy. They had not seen it. They had never read it. <laughs> this is how bad it was. It's very similar now. A lot of people don't know much of the Bible either. That claim to be God's people. I fault the shepherds for that. They bring up the book of Deuteronomy and the king says, oh, read it to me. And as they're reading it to him, his knees are knocking because he's realizing we are under judgment. God is going to judge this nation. And th this is all in the days of Jeremiah. This is the beginning of Jeremiah's ministry. And the king did start something like a reformation or people call it a revival, but I don't know if it was a revival because it was basically top down. He's just wiping out all the sodomites and all the t pagan temples and everything like that. But as soon as he dies, other bad kings come in and everything just goes right back to normal. And Jeremiah's call is very, very heartbreaking. It's a long story, which I'll get into someday. Again, because I did do a series on Jeremiah many years ago. Um, but he's called to try to bring Judah to repentance because a judgment is coming and from the north it's a Babylonian invasion and he's saying this is going to happen and there's no stopping it because of the sins of the kings of Judah. I mean, he's really... Now, his whole life he's given this message and he even gets a, a much more unpopular aspect. Because as the Babylonians are coming closer and closer, a spirit of patriotism gripped the nation. They, sometimes patriotism can be confused with spirituality. We're not going to let the Babylonians beat us. We're going to fight back. And they go out and they try to find allies in Egypt and everything like that. And so the whole time... They're, the false prophets, which outnumber true prophets every time, are saying, thus saith the Lord, the, we are going to prevail over the Babylonians. And Jeremiah's message is, no, surrender to the Babylonians. This is a punishment from God. Now, who wants to preach a message of surrender, especially in a time of patriotism? You need to see this as a judgment from God. You need to go out there and accept this. This is God's punishment on Judah, and he gives all the reasons why. That's the bulk of the Jeremiah's message. And in the meantime, uh, the way the Babylonians did it is, and it was predicted by Joel. Remember, Joel had a vision hundreds of years earlier of a locust invasion. Remember that? And the locust, in, in Joel's vision... He sees the four stages of a locust life. See, the, the, uh, thank God we've never seen a locust invasion. I guess there was one in Iowa back in the 1860s. Did you know that? Come like a cloud and eat everything in sight. Well, basically, it's not even just that simple. I mean, it's a hideous thought, a locust invasion. But what I didn't realize is that when locusts come, first, uh, they're just ravenous from their journey. They can have a cloud as big as the state of Iowa. Second, they eat everything they can see, but then before they go, they drill a little hole in the ground and lay an egg. So just when you're hoping for something green to come out of the ground, remember this is agrarian people living hand to mouth, 
That's when the babies come out. And then they start eating. And Joel, Joel saw it in four stages. First, he called, I think, the, the swarm, and then the gnars, and then the lickers, and then the chompers. And by the time they're done, there's nothing, nothing, nothing left. Now, guess what literally happened in the Babylonian invasion? They come because Judah tries to make a treaty with Egypt and resist Babylon. And so what Nebuchadnezzar does is he just plucks out the royal family. Just takes up the king, his mother, and the family. And just takes them off to Babylon. Now you've got to understand what the royal family means to the Jews ever since 2 Samuel 7. The royal family, the son of David, the son of God, the promise of God that a son of David would rule on the throne forever and ever. And Babylon just walks in. The king of Babylon is a type of the devil. Just walks in, just plucks it up. Says, you give us any more trouble, I'll be back. And he appoints the king's brother, real weakling. Okay. And they did give more trouble because you got this con conflict between the false and the true prophets. The false prophets are saying, resist the Babylonians, make alliances, go out there and get some friends, and let's just throw off the yoke. Jeremiah is saying, no, don't throw off the yoke. Submit to it. And they hate him. Right? And so Nebuchadnezzar came back, and what he did this time is he took everyone with any skill. Can you imagine, like, anyone that knew anything in society, all the leaders and the productive managerial class or whatever, just plucks them all up, takes them to Babylon, never to be seen again. 400 miles. And this still goes on, this big conflict, as the Babylonians are getting closer and closer to, to, to coming in and invading. Uh, they don't listen to Jeremiah at all. And the third time they came and they destroyed the temple. They raised it to the ground. I mean, not one stone left on another. Now, the, 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 the Jews were trying to bolster false courage in the days leading up to that. The whole time they're rejecting Jeremiah. They're saying, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. Now, Jeremiah gave a great sermon, that's in Jeremiah 7, where he said, look, you go around saying the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. Don't you remember what happened at Shiloh? Now, I know you guys all know what happened at Shiloh, so I'm going to, oh, wait, someone rose their hand. All right, I'll explain it. That's 1 Samuel 4. That was a couple hundred years earlier, in which... The, Phil, uh, the uh, Philistines were just controlling the Jews, the very heavy, humiliating yoke. And they were trying to throw them off. So they have one battle in which they just rattle, rouse up the troops and they go to war with the Philistines. And they get beat and they lose like 2,000 people. And that's terrible, right? And they're on their way back from the battle, and they're going, how did we lose that battle? Now, they didn't offer one prayer. They didn't say anything about God. They just, we're going to throw off the yoke. And they go, how did we lose that battle? And then someone says, you know what? I got an idea. See, if they only would have stopped at how did we lose that battle and realized that that's a theological question, because the law of God said, if I'm with you, one will put a thousand to flight and two will put 10,000 to flight. So that is a good question. How is it that we lost that battle if one put a thousand to flight two? Maybe it would have turned them to God. But instead, someone brought up a distraction. That's what Jeremiah said. Don't you remember what happened at Shiloh? Here's the distraction. Let's go to the ark and get it out of the tabernacle and take it to battle against the Philistines. Surely with it we shall prevail. And you know what? 
A surge of excitement went through the crowd. Yes, that sounds so right. And one of the reasons why it sounds right, it sounds so spiritual and religious. Only it's not. Because you cannot reduce God to it. But the last thing that they ever dreamed could happen, happened. Because the ark was captured in battle. And by the way, it says in the text, they were talking about it, and then it says, so they went and took the ark of the covenant of God, who dwells between the cherubim. How many know there's a difference between it and who? When you treat God like it, you, you're going to get in a lot of trouble. So they take it to battle, and the priests, the high priest of Israel's sons died. The high priest died that day, and the worst thing, 4,000 people were killed, and then the ark was captured. Now, you've got to understand, in their mind, that's unthinkable. That is the throne of God on earth. How could God become a prisoner of war. But that's what happened. So many centuries later, Jeremiah, they're going around going, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. You know what that means? We've got the temple of the Lord. God dwells in the midst of us, and there's no way we could be defeated by the Babylonians. They could, they could have they could have seen through that if they read their Bible. If they had read the book of 1 Samuel, they would have seen through the folly of that. Look, the uh, temple of God is not inv only in inviolable as long as God dwells there. If God doesn't live in the temple anymore, then all bets are off the table. Amen? So this is what happened. That, that, that temple got raised, and that was, okay, remember Joel's vision. The, the locusts came in three waves, four waves. They take the king, they take the great people, they take the temple. And then they come one, one last time to take anyone worth anything, and they, all they leave is just the poorest of the poor to scratch a meager living out of the soil. And in Jeremiah 29, these are, he's writing to the people that got taken away. And he's saying... Look, God hasn't given up on you yet. How many, has anyone ever done something so bad you wonder if God hasn't given up on you? I've been there or I've at least felt that. You see, God has not given up on you yet. That's the context for that verse. I, I have plans for you. I'm not done with you yet. The thoughts I think toward you are thoughts of good and not evil to give you something to look forward to. And then, but then he, he doesn't just say that. That's not all it says because he says, then you'll call on me. And if you seek me with all your heart, this is a great promise. It's not just to Israel. I, I have employed this promise so many times in my own life. Where you could, you could get to a point where it seems like God is a million miles away. But God's promise is true. It is always true. It's truer than your feelings. It's truer than your experience. If you seek him with all your heart, you will find him. If you'll seek him with all of your heart. Well, maybe this is the only reason I'm supposed to give this sermon today. Just this truth right here, although I will go on. What does it mean, seek God? It's a, it's a deliberate thing. Like, you've got to set your mind and even your soul, your affections on the things of God, even if you don't feel a thing. Even if you feel a million miles away. You know in your knower. Like, we were just singing the song tonight, and that must have been the Holy Spirit. Why are you so downcast, oh, my soul? Who are you talking to, by the way? Yourself. <laughs> You're preaching to yourself. And you should. Like there's a part of you that feels, and that's not as real as a part of what you know that you know that you know in the deepest part of your soul. You know that you know you know there's a God. He has a claim on your life, and he owns you. And there comes a time in your life, and I might be talking to just one person out there too. There comes a time in your life where you got to just stop everything else and set your soul, set your thoughts, and set your heart on the things of God. You, you, you could start with the word and with worship. Now, there's people out there, you just need to go back to church. 
Seek the Lord while he can be found. Call upon him while he's near. So Jeremiah gives this beautiful letter. He says, look, you're going into captivity. You're going to go to Babylon, 400 miles away. I always think of that uh, psalm, by the rivers of Babylon. There we laid down our harps and we wept. And we said, they said, sing us the songs of Zion. Well, how can we when we're so far away? And then he goes on to say, look, if I forget you, Jerusalem, may my right hand lose its cunning, okay? If I ever forget you. Now, he, he's not talking about just the city, but everything the city stands for, right? May I never let that go away. May Babylon not rip me off. May the world not rip you off. Jeremiah says, look, you build your homes, have kids, and be a blessing to Babylon. Just be a blessing to them. And that actually literally happened. I mean, you got a few shining examples like Daniel. I'd say Daniel was a blessing. Here he is working for the king of Babylon, who's a type of the devil. And yet, uh, he's one of the best assets that that king had. And God used him, see. So, uh, then what chapter 30 is is an expansion on what he said in that promise. The plans I have for you are for good and not evil and to give you a, an expected hope. Now, it's not unconditional. It's like, if you seek me with all your heart, you'll be found of me. So the word, now I'm just gonna go highlight a few verses that I really think are blessings. By, by the way, this passage is so full of beautiful verses of the Bible. You're probably familiar with them. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, thus speaketh the Lord God of Israel saying, write thee all the works, words that I have spoken unto thee in a book. And here we are 3,000 years later reading that. <laughs> Isn't this awesome, right? The continuity of the word of God. For lo, the days come, saith the Lord, that I'll bring again the captivity of my people, Israel and Judah, saith the Lord. And I'll cause them to return to the land that I gave to their fathers, and they shall possess it. So you're going to go 400 miles away. And by the way, it's only two of the tribes that are going to go, Judah and Benjamin. Those are the only two surviving tribes and any holdovers from the others. But the rest were just taken into oblivion, right? And yet the word of the Lord and God himself said to Jeremiah, write this down in a book. By the way, you're going to find out this is also a dream that he had. Because toward the end of it, he says, then I woke up and I just felt so good. You know, how bad would you feel when the last king of Judah to ever sit on the throne of David is carted off into captivity? And you know what's really sick about it? That he gets to Babylon and they kill his sons right in front of him. And then they put out his eyes so that the last thing that king saw was the slaughter of his sons. It's not just his sons. It's the son of, the, of David. <laughs> it's the hope of Israel. The way Isaiah saw it is it'll be like a stump that just gets cut down, then it gets burnt. It's sitting there smoldering. Although Isaiah gives us good news. Choo! The last thing you'd expect, a shoot shoots out of that stump. See, a lot of people don't realize one of the names for Jesus, the Messiah in the Old Testament, is the branch, the netzer. And the hope, in the least expected time, the hope, boing. Anyway, let me go on. He says, I'm going to bring again the captivity of my people. But look at the way he says it, Israel and Judah. Remember those 10 tribes? People call them the lost tribes of the house of Israel or the lost tribes of Israel. Well, they're not lost to God. God knows where they are. God knows who they are. God made a fantastic promise here. Don't worry, I'm not done. I'm going to bring you all, all 12 tribes, back to the land. By the time this is done, all of you, and you're gonna go right back and possess that land. Now they would do this 
Judah would do this at 70 years, but he's not talking about that. Is he saying, no, it's going to be bigger than Judah. It's going to be all the tribes. See, that's about ready to happen. All the tribes of Israel will be brought back to the land. These are the words that the Lord spoke concerning Israel and concerning Judah. For thus saith the Lord, we heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. Ask ye now and see whether a man doth travail with child. Why do I see every man with his hands on his loins, as a woman in travail, and every face turned into paleness? Now, if you get scared enough, your face turns red. But if you get really, really scared, your face turns white. Okay, pallor. Your knee's knocking. What's he saying? How, what? See, he told you, I've got a plan for you, a plan for good or not evil, to bring you an expected hand. Number one, I'm going to bring all 12 tribes back to the land. But number two, but first, you have to go through a very, very special, short, but severe trial. And he says, the way I, that he describes it prophetically, you ever seen a man have a baby? No, you haven't. And you wouldn't want to ever feel so bad you're having a baby. He says, then why do I see people, why do I see men clutching their loins, their knees knocking, they're turning pale? The answer, verse seven, alas, for that day is great. There's no, none like it. It's even the time of Jacob's trouble. But he will be saved out of it. Now one thing about the Old Testament is they talk, they alternate between Jacob and Israel, Jacob and Israel, Jacob and Israel. And it's the same person. So why does sometimes he talk about Jacob and sometimes he talk, calls him Israel? Well, Israel is an ideal name, really. It's what they're going to be at the end. It's the highest ideals of God for them. But Jacob is a realistic name. That's what they are now. Okay. And he, it's the time of Jacob's trouble, which he says a time's going to come that will be reminiscent of when Jacob was so afraid for his life because Esau was coming that he had that long, dark night, which involved separation from everything that he once loved and had, and ultimately the most severe wrestling match he'd ever been in. And it turned out he wasn't wrestling Esau. It turns out all this time he'd been wrestling God. And it was a great match because uh, God let him wrestle him up to a point. And then God touched him on the hip. Now, there's a guy here from Iowa named Dan Gable, who's considered the greatest expert on the sport of wrestling the world's ever seen. And I, I don't doubt it. I mean, he's an amazing person, okay? And he once said that the most important part of your body in your wrestling, the strongest part, the most significant part to keep in control is your hip. So God just hit Jacob on the strongest part, and he walked with a limp for the rest of his life. But the match wasn't over. Went on until sunup. Only the difference is Jacob was no longer wrestling. He was clinging to God. Do you get it? There's a message from God for all of us here. A very dark night is coming. A very, very serious time, especially for the Jews. I pray to God that the, the rapture happens. I, I really do. I mean, I hope no one writes me and condemns me, but you know, I want to go home to be with the Lord. But look, if I have to, but look, there's a terrible, terrible night coming and a terrible wrestling. And who is Israel? Why did he get the name Israel? When the sun came up, he, he's clinging. He won't let go. And God himself is saying, let me go, let me go. He says, I won't let you go unless you bless me. He says, all right, then from here on, your name is Israel. It's the ideal name. What's it mean? Someone who wrestled with God 
and prevailed. But wait a minute, he didn't win. If there would have been a ref there, you'd think he would have put Jacob's hand up and God's hand down? I don't think so. What's the point? We win by losing. <laughs> this is the contradiction. We win by surrender to God and clinging to God. That's how we go through the long, dark night of the soul. This is the last three and a half years, the great tribulation warned of by all the prophets. But look what he says. It's the time of Jacob's trouble, but he will be saved out of it. What's going to happen, among other things, which we've talked about very much, is that there's a part of the world that's just sick of the Jews, and especially sick of losing to the Jews. And they are going to compile their forces. There is coming an Islamic superstate, believe me, who will try to invade Israel. And I mean, all, by all odds, by every reasonable odd, they should just wipe them out. No problem. It shouldn't even exist anymore. They've got the power and the will and the hate. It's coming. Ezekiel 38. We talked about Psalm 83. We talked about Edom. There's coming an Antichrist. I don't know if he's going to come from the sophisticated part of Europe or from the backwards to the Turks and all those, and the Muslims. But an Antichrist gum, he's going to have a supernatural hatred for Israel. This is part of why there is a great tribulation. God says, I, have, uh, I want you to know my thoughts toward you, he said in that letter, are great. And uh, I have a plan and I have something to give you an expected end. And he's giving it. I'm going to, here's the program. I'm going to bring you back to the land, all 12 tribes, and you're going to take that land back that was given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm bringing you back to the land. But first, a serious trial, the time of Jacob's trouble. And he'll explain more in, the, in the, just these two chapters. He says, uh, last of that day is great. There's none like it, verse 7. None like it. See, I actually saw a Bible commentator say, well, that happened back in the days of Babylon. No, there's none like it. That happened in the, in the 70 AD. Well, that was bad, but none like it. Jesus said it this way, and so did Daniel. Daniel said, in the last day, man, Michael, your prince is going to stand up, the prince of your people. And then there will be great tribulation like the world has never seen before and will never be seen again. Jesus said, look, when you see the sacrilege, if you happen to live in Judea, you run to the mountains of the wilderness. You get out of there. Don't even go back for your coat. Why? Because then there should be tribulation like the world has never seen before and never will see again. I mean, if you think of like the Holocaust, how bad could it be? Could it get worse? How bad? How what a nightmare. A systematic extermination by very efficient people trying to get every last Jew wiped out. Hmm. He says, verse 8, it'll come to pass. So we're still explaining that verse. I know the plans I have for you. They're plans for good and not evil. I'm going to give you something to look forward to. And he says, it'll come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I'll break his yoke from off your neck. And I will burst your bonds and strangers shall no longer serve themselves of you. See, Moses had told them in the curse of the law, if you are faithless, I'm going to put a yoke, I'm going to have Gentiles put a yoke on your neck and you're not going to be sovereign. And that's really what it means, the times of the Gentiles. The times, the long, long centuries where Israel could not be a sovereign nation. It could not be. Uh, it would be under custody of the Gentiles. You got the Babylonians, you got the Persians, you got the Greeks, you got the Romans, you got the Muslims. Recently, you had the British. Now you have America. You think that they could just do whatever they want? No, they have to check with us. They are not free. The, the times of the Gentiles aren't over yet. They're very close, though. He says, I'll break that yoke 
Verse 9, but they'll serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up unto them. Now look at verse 9. This is still part of the answer. What do you mean the thoughts you have for us are good and not evil? Something to look forward to. This is part of it. You, you're going to, of course, you're going to go through a very short period, but I'm going to save you out of it, and I'm going to break the power of your enemies. And then when he says, you will serve the Lord your God and David your king, he's saying, you will be converted, finally. See, David, their king, is shorthand in prophetic language for Christ, for Messiah. Messiah is called the son of David. Okay. Out of Jesse, Isaiah said, a shoot will pour out. Now, why did he say out of Jesse and not David? Because he's not giving us another son of Jesse. In Jesus, we have another David. In fact, we have the original David. What's David mean? Beloved. We got the real one that's beloved of the Lord, the real man after God's own heart, the one that never, ever broke faith. That's our Savior and our Lord. He says to the Jews, look, finally, finally, when I break the yoke and when you come through the dark night and you will realize then what it was all for, what it was all about, then you will be converted. This is the same thing uh, Zechariah said. They will look on me whom they pierced and mourn for him as for an only son. Hosea says that then they will return to the land after many days and then they shall Seek the Lord their God and David their king. Okay, this is a much repeated phrase in the Bible. Therefore fear thou not, O my servant Jacob, saith the Lord. Neither be dismayed, O Israel, for lo, I'll save you from afar and your seed from the land of their captivity. Jacob shall return. He shall be in rest and be quiet, and no one will make him afraid. For I am with thee, saith the Lord, to save thee. Though I make a full end of all nations where I have scattered thee, yet will I not make a full end of thee, but I will correct thee in measure and will not leave thee altogether unpunished. Now, when Jesus comes back, as we've said many times, one of the reasons he's coming back is to make a war on specific nations. Now, this is really frightening. I mean, when Jesus, make, Jesus makes war, it's just that idea, it's mind-blowing for some people, but it's true. He's coming back to make war on certain nations. And those nations are the ones that really accelerated the scattering and destruction of Israel. And he says here, I'm going to make a full end of those nations. Now, there are two places on this earth, the Bible says, will be absolutely uninhabitable even through the millennium. Babylon. Southern Iraq, and Edom. <laughs> Edom. Of Edom, the prophets say, the smoke of the torment will rise forever. That's where you get this imagery from hell. Edom. The Arabs, the Muslim people, they make a religion out of hating Jews. God says, I'm going to make a full end of some of these. Now, some of the, some of the Arab nations have come through and be converted. Egypt. But even for 40 years into the millennium, according to the prophets, Egypt itself will be uninhabitable. Something so bad happens there, I have no idea what. That the Egyptians themselves have to flee out of Egypt. That's never happened. I mean, the Jews had to make an exodus out of Egypt, but the Egyptians never made an exodus out of Egypt. Well, they will. See, they all, they all let me be frank, they all hate the Jews. They, their religion makes them do it. I know. I don't want to sound like a broken record. He says, I will correct you. Verse, I have not, I have scattered, I'll make a full end of all the nations where I've scattered you. I won't make a full end of you, though. I will not. The Jews will be around forever. For, uh, but I will correct you in measure, and I will not leave you altogether unpunished. Well, Israel is a very, very sinful place. 12, thus saith the Lord, your bruise is incurable, your wound is grievous. Tel Aviv is the most gay-friendly city in the world. Jerusalem's so evil that God himself calls it Sodom and Egypt in the book of Revelation. Jews don't believe 
They persecute people that are Jews that do want to believe. They don't do as much as bad as the Muslims, but uh, th they still have the same hatred. There's none to plead thy cause there, that you may be bound up. There's no healing medicines. What All your lovers have forgotten you. See, he's talking about how in the end they'll, they'll, they'll be totally, totally alienated. There's no, no none to please thy cause. That's just saying you don't have a lawyer that can get you off what, the suit. You don't have a doctor that can actually heal what's wrong with you. And your lovers have all left you. Now look, that's why I think Biden is a better fit for prophecy than Trump. Because God is going to cut off all of her lovers so that they can only look to him. I have wounded thee with the wound of an enemy, with the chastisement of a cruel one, for the multitude of your iniquities, because your sins were increased. Why are you crying for your affliction? Your sorrow is incurable for the multitude of your iniquities, because thy sins were increased. I did these things to you. Therefore, all they that devour thee shall be devoured. All your adversaries, every one of them, shall go into captivity. And they that spoil thee shall be a spoil. And all that prey upon thee will I give for a prey. For I will restore health unto thee. I will heal thee of thy wounds, saith the Lord. Because they called thee an outcast, saying, This is Zion, whom no man seeks after. By the way, what's the, a, a dirty word to call someone in modern political parlance? A Zionist. You a Zionist? God is a Zionist. You kidding me? The controversy is called the controversy of Zion. And what is Zion? It, it, it has to do, Zion technically, biblically, has to do with David and Jerusalem and the continuance of the throne of David. That's really what it is. Now the devil hates that. All right. So anyway, let me move on. Thus saith the Lord, verse 18. Behold, I'll bring again the captivity of da Jacob's tents and have mercy on his dwelling places. The city shall be built on her own heap. The palace shall remain after the manner thereof. And out of them shall proceed thanksgiving and the voice of them that make merry. And I will multiply them and they will not be few. I will also glorify them and they shall not be small. This is all expanding on the letter that says, I know the plans I have for you. They're plans for good and not evil to give you something to look forward to. Their children all shall be as before time and their congregation shall be established before me and I'll punish all of those that oppress them. And their nobles shall be of themselves and their governor shall proceed from the midst of them and I'll cause him to draw near and he shall approach unto me for who is this that engaged his heart to approach unto me, saith the Lord. He's saying, your leader is going to be of you. He's going to be a Jew. Well, guess who he's going to be? He's going to be the greatest Jew of all, the Lord Jesus Christ. And you will be my people, and I'll be your God. That's covenant language. Behold, the whirlwind of the Lord goeth forth with fury, a continuing whirlwind. It shall fall with pain on the head of the wicked. The fierce anger of the Lord will not return until he has done it and until he has performed the intents of his heart. Now listen, in the latter days, you'll understand this. In the latter days. See, one thing that I've said many times, I'll say it again. When the Lord comes to make war, against specific nations, and the Bible actually tells you which nations. It just so happens that every one of them is Muslim. The whirlwind's coming because they took the wrong side. They went against God. I, I, I grieve for Muslims. I pray for them. 1.7 billion Muslims. I pray. And by the way, good news, many, many, many Muslims are becoming Christians. And you know who some of the greatest evangelists of the Muslims are? ISIS, the Islamic Republic of Iran. You know why they're evangelists? Because Muslims could just ache and grind, groan and bellyache all these centuries. Like, we wish we could have Sharia. We wish we could have it. Then this would be paradise. Well, they finally got it in Iran. Most young people hate it. I mean, there, there are actually, not only is there a Christian revival there, but there's just a Zoroastrian revival there. They would take anything but Allah. All right. It's just the mullahs have a death grip on the country. And this new one, wow. This new mullah, 
he is from Satan. He really is. And ISIS has bring, brought a lot of people to Christ because so many, remember the Muslims are human beings. And when they see these atrocities and they try to argue against them and realize that the people doing the atrocities, Quranically speaking, are winning all the arguments. Of course, this is what Muhammad did. It does something to some of them that still have humanity. And many have been coming to Jesus. Now, let me go to the next chapter, because I told you I wanted to go through both these chapters, and I'm not going to take it too long, but uh, they go together, and, and it just something about this really struck me. Some, so many beautiful promises. At that same time, saith the Lord, I will be the God of all the families of Israel, and they will be my people. So all 12 tribes are going to come back. The exile will be over, and they will worship God. They will worship God. And of course, they will worship God through Jesus Christ, through David their king. Thus saith the Lord, the people which were left of the sword found grace in the wilderness. Even Israel, when I went to cause him to rest. Now, this is really a powerful thing, if you realize. In the tribulation, any Jew that takes Jesus' advice. When you see a certain sacrilege, run to the wilderness. That's going to save their lives. Because, and they know about that, by the way. They do. When you see the sacrilege, the abomination that makes desolate, run to the wilderness. Now, what's going to happen out in the wilderness? Well, the exodus gets re replayed. What happened with the, the Exodus? Well, the children of Israel out in the wilderness, and God was with them. So they lived in tents, not houses, but God was there. And whatever they needed, God provided. So they're out in the wilderness, running for their lives from ISIS or whoever else, because the savages will one day overrun Jerusalem. They will flee for their lives. And they'll go out in the wilderness. And what, what happens in the wilderness? Many people come to God in the wilderness because God is there with them in their hardship. The people that in the wilderness found grace, it says. I love this verse. The people that were left of the sword, whoever survives the anti-Semitic onslaught that's coming and runs out into the wilderness, they find grace out there. Even Israel, when I went to cause him to rest. Now he's talking in past tense, but it's going to happen. Jesus Christ himself, before he comes to Jerusalem, is going to spend quite a bit of time in the wilderness. What people don't realize, the second coming of Jesus is not a one-day event. It's a series of events. He goes to Bosra. Where's that? In the desert south of the Dead Sea. He goes to Timon. Where's that? In the desert south of the Dead Sea. He goes to Edom. Where's that? In the most arid desert on the face of the earth. Don't take my word for it. Isaiah 63. Who is this that comes from Edom? Why are you spattered red with blood? Well, I, I've come to tread the winepress of the wrath of God Almighty. I had to do it myself. No one else could do it. See, this, the second coming of Jesus is a series of events. It replaced the Exodus too because he, he starts in that part of the world and he heads up to Jerusalem. And then we know in Zechariah 12, his feet shall touch the Mount of Olives. Now let me move on here. Just a few more verses. And I will build thee again. You will be built, O virgin of Israel. Oh, they're going to be a virgin again. God can restore your virginity. Isaiah says, how the faithful city became a harlot. Righteousness once dwelt there, but now sin. And the harlot theme gets reversed in the end. You're a virgin daughter of Zion, virgin of Israel. You shall again be adorned with thy tabrets. You shall go forth in the dances of them that make merry. You shall yet plant vines on the mountains of Samaria. The planters shall plant and shall eat them as common things. For there shall be a day that the watchmen on the Mount Ephraim shall cry, Rise, let's go up to Zion unto the Lord our God. What's he saying? Worship of the true God will return back to the land of Israel, which is awesome. For thus saith the Lord, sing with gladness for Jacob, shout among the chief of the nations, publish ye, praise ye, and say, O Lord, save thy people, save the remnant of Israel. So he wants us to pray for him. 
Behold, I'll bring them from the north country and gather them from the coast of the earth, and with them the blind and the lame and the woman with child and her that travails with child together. A great company shall return there. They shall come with weeping and with supplications will I lead them. I will cause them to walk by the rivers of water in a straight way, wherein they shall not stumble. For I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim, why well, he's my firstborn. Ephraim is the, is the ten tribes, supposedly lost. Now, you ever seen films of people coming back from Europe to the Holy Land in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, 70s? People coming from Ethiopia. You know what they're doing? They're weeping. They're, the Jews are weeping as they go back to the land. Now, we were talking about this the other night. That is so significant. Any Bible person that tells you there's no significance in 1948 and that, get away from them. They don't know what they're talking about. But it is not the complete picture. The exile's not over until all 12 tribes are back and they all believe. But it sure is a picture of what's going to happen. Hear the word of the Lord, O ye nations. Declare it to the isles afar off and say, He that scattered Israel will gather him and keep him as a shepherd doth his flock. I love verse 10. He that scattered Israel is going to go out and regather them. For the Lord hath redeemed Jacob and ransomed him from the hand of him that was stronger than he. Therefore they shall come and sing in the height of Zion and shall flow together to the goodness of the Lord for wheat and for wine and for oil. Oh, it's just so beautiful. And for the young of the flock and of the herd and their soul shall be as a watered garden and they shall not sorrow anymore. Then shall the virgin rejoice in the dance, both young men and old together, for I will turn their mourning into joy. I will comfort them and make them rejoice from their sorrow and I will satiate the soul of the priests with fatness and my people shall be satisfied with my goodness, saith the Lord. The priest, that's a ministry. They'll have something to say again. <laughs> It's a curse to have dead ministry, by the way. Thus saith the Lord. Now, verse 15. Here's another one. I know you've heard this. A voice is heard in Rama, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel, weeping for her children, refused to be comforted for her children because they were not. Now, Matthew uses this verse to talk about the slaughter that Herod made of the holy innocents, where he killed children, trying to kill Jesus. And he said, that fulfilled this. I believe this is fulfilled over and over and over again, over the centuries. Rachel, always weeping, even from the grave, weeping for the anti-Semitic slaughter of Jews. And this is uh, part of the sadness of the story, but verse 16, Thus saith the Lord, refrain thy voice from weeping and thine eyes from tears. For thy work shall be rewarded, saith the Lord, and they shall come again from the hand of the enemy. Verse 16, uh, And there is hope in thine end, saith the Lord, that thy children shall come again to their border. Now look, we're all Rachel. We, we mourn and grieve for children and we cry out to God. But see, what I see in, in these passages, before I go any further, is the heart of God, is the heart of God. Like I say, Israel is a microcosm of the human race. In a way, we're all Hebrews. We've all crossed over to God's side. We're all the subject of God's dealings. We're all uh, the object of Satan's attack. And God has a heart for us. He doesn't, he doesn't, uh, where, where does it say that? He says, I have loved you, verse 3, with an everlasting love. Look at, look at 31.3, one of my favorites. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. See, when you read the rest of Jeremiah and you see God's, condemnation of their sin and their repudiation of him and their persecution of the prophets and their love of idols and I mean just the, the way they just slap him in the face and here at the end of Jeremiah God is saying to these people you know what I love you and I've loved you with an everlasting love it, it's, it's powerful right it's so powerful 
And therefore, with cords of kindness, loving kindness, I've drawn you. Now, I've, look, I've been accused because of my preaching of, of, of not believing in God loving people or saying, because God's not loving, and he's not as loving as you think or whatever. And look, it's not true. I mean, of course, God, this is astonishing. And the fact that God could still love Israel after all their sins. See, a lot of people uh, throw stones at Israel and condemn them. But they're in, all they're doing is throwing stones at themselves. Someone says, how could God choose such a sick, nasty, backslidden, horrible, weak, faithless country? And I say, well, why would God choose you exactly. and me? <laughs> So this verse comes like a breath of fresh air. I've loved you with an everlasting love. Now, people probably condemn me for, for that because I preach against the unbiblical notion of unconditional love. I mean, <laughs> two-thirds of Israel is going to be killed in the tribulation. I hate that. The ones that won't believe, the, one, the ones that won't cling to God, the ones that won't give up on their eyes, they're, 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 they're going to die. Okay, but still he reaches out to them. They still have this word right now. To this very day, they have this word they could apply to. They could listen to the prophet Jeremiah and go, really, God loves me? Isn't that supposed to soften our hearts? Isn't that supposed to make us want to love him in response? It is true that God takes the initiative. We love him because he loved us first. But the message of love, that's supposed to change us and tenderize us toward God. We should love God, right, in response to him. Now, let me just show you a couple more verses and then... I'm going to uh, I'm going to let you go, okay? And that's two, uh, the verse 31. Now look, how long has this exile gone on? Well, like almost 3,000 years, okay. And you think, well, <laughs> what good are these promises if for 2,900 years these people have been in exile, suffering, dying, going to hell, all that? Why did it take so long? And I'm going to give you my theory on that because that wouldn't be very loving to say man I want to do all this stuff for you and 3,000 years from now that's what I mean. <laughs> it couldn't be that that's really the way he wanted it what he really wanted to do and he shows us this in verse 31 behold the days come saith the Lord that I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they broke, although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. This is what he wanted, to give them a new covenant. Now, uh, why? The old covenant is, is perfect Right? It, you can't say God gave something imperfect. I mean, the law and the Torah is perfect. And by the way, people that don't love, like the law, they don't get it either. The law is fantastic. Why do we need a new covenant? Because the experience of Israel demonstrates that we human beings are so intractable, so fallen, so faithless, that even if you give us something perfect, all it's going to do is bring the worst out of us. I mean, this is like Jeremiah's like at the end. I mean, it was after King Manasseh and all that. I mean, the, 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 the insults to God, the, the, I mean, there shouldn't even be an Israel. But God never gives up. I mean, he doesn't throw people away. So he wanted to bring them into a new covenant. Okay, like the law is written on rock. Well, that's exterior to us. He wants to write it on our heart. See, not according to the covenant I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they broke, although I was a husband to them, saith the Lord. He just, he just had a wedding at the foot of the mountain, and they just said, yes, I do. And no sooner that happened than they're whoring after golden calves. Crazy, right? He says, this will be the covenant I'll make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I'll put my law in their inward parts. I'll write it in their hearts. I'll be their God, and they'll be my people, 
and they'll teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Now this is so awesome. Okay, first of all, he said, I, I, I want to get rid of the old and give you a new. I want to put my law right in your heart. Give you an inward sympathy for it. Okay. And not only that, I want to uh, make it so that everybody in the nation knows God personally. No gurus. You don't need a guru. You do not need a guru. All shall know me from the least to the greatest. It's a knowledge of God. <laughs> It goes right to the heart. I mean, what is the privilege of every single child of God from the first time they're born again to know God? There's two privileges, to know God and to be forgiven of their sins. What is the biggest need we have? I have to admit it. It's humbling. We need forgiveness. How much? All the time. Constantly. Look what he says. This is radical forgiveness. Not only will I forgive their sins, I won't even remember them anymore. Okay. This is the new covenant. So I'm answering the question, why did it take 2,600 years? And they still haven't come into it. I mean, what, what, what was the point of all that good stuff he's offering them if they have to wait 3,000 years for it? What happened? Well, what happened is, let me take a stab at it. What would have really happened if the Jews would have recognized that Jesus is the Messiah and would have accepted him right on the spot. Now, I'm not going to play imagination games, but I'm pretty sure one thing that would have happened would be this. They'd be able to step out from underneath the old covenant and come into a new covenant. And a lot of stuff would be different, right? But they rejected Jesus. And one of the consequences of rejecting Jesus is that they're still under the curse of the law of God. Read Deuteronomy 28 sometime. But don't do it at night. It's too scary. It's too real. How long have they been there all this time? They don't want Jesus. It doesn't match their idea of Messiah. So therefore, they don't get the new covenant. So what's God going to do with a new covenant that the people, it was, notice it says, this is for the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It didn't say the house of Ireland or, and Scotland. Okay. Then what do you do with a new covenant that the people that it was designed for don't, don't have it? Well, like the parable of the feast. Go out and get the lame, the blind, the halt, the poverty stricken, the beggars, the, the, the scum of the earth. Bring them in and let's have a feast together. We get the new covenant. See, we're, we're, we're just the placeholders. The best player on the team is still on the bench. We're the vanguard, the power of the age to come. You know what we have? What is being born again? All sympathy with the law of God inscribed in my heart. Doesn't mean that I live it out perfectly, but I got a brand new principle. It's not on stone anymore, it's in here. I know the Lord and you know the Lord. You don't need a guru, right? And as a pastor, I've never tried to be a guru. We don't need gurus. We need God. And everybody needs God. And what else? Radical, radical forgiveness. Could you even be here if forgiveness was in the least bit complicated? What's he say? I'll forgive all their sins and their iniquities, and I will not even remember them anymore. That's why that one verse in Micah, he will cast our sins into the depths of the sea of forgetfulness. It's fantastic, right? We get, now they don't get, they don't have that. What do they have? A dead, dry, empty religion actually concocted by them because they can't even practice the biblical Judaism. My people have committed two evils. They've forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and they hewed out cisterns that don't even hold water. That's Judaism. They, they don't get what we get. We, we got something so awesome. Now, has this been a blessing to the Gentiles? I think so. It's actually changed the world. Christianity's changed the world. But never forget verse 31. I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. 
No, not the house of Randalls. Not the house of Rupp. <laughs> okay, then what are we doing with it? Well, that's the meaning of the, the wedding feast. Oh, they, they don't want to come? Oh, I'll find someone. I'll give it to them. Now, this is temporary too. The day is going to come, and not many days from now, where he is going to focus back on them. He's already bringing them back to the land. What's next? Well, a terrible tribulation, but a conversion, a salvation. That's going to involve this. This has not happened to the original recipients yet. This has happened to you and me, the mere placeholders. The beggar that was on the street corner, that someone says, you want to come to a feast? Who, who me? Who would want me at the feast? Well, the king does. <laughs> I've never been to a feast before. I'm going to tell you something. When I found out about the gospel, I'd never heard anything so good in all my life. I couldn't believe my good fortune. Now, there's one more thing, though. Okay, now, this is funny. And, and please, bear with me, all right? Um, don't pass out yet, all right? Uh, <laughs> um, Arnold's Fruchtenbaum is a tremendous uh, Hebrew Christian teacher and scholar. I don't know what you'd call him, but he's, he's really good. I like him anyway. And he has this teaching like, I want to tell the enemies of Israel how you can best destroy them. Now, can you imagine <laughs> Palestinians and everyone, oh, really? Yay, yay, show me. And he turns them to Jeremiah 31, verse 35. Thus saith the Lord, which gives the sun for a light by day, and the ordinances of the moon and the stars for a light by night, which divides the sea when the waves thereof roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If those ordinances ever depart from before me, saith the Lord, then the seed of Israel shall also cease from being a nation before me forever. So he said, all you got to do is destroy the moon and the sun and the star. <laughs> what is he saying? That his faithfulness is everlasting. It endures forever. Well, that's another song we sang tonight. I think it's Psalm 36. Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. Your righteousness is like majestic mountains. Your wisdom, the depths of the sea. Thus saith the Lord, 37, in closing, if heaven above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out beneath, I will also cast all the seed of Israel for all that they have done, saith the Lord. Well, they, he, didn't, he doesn't deny they did a lot of bad things. But he gave an impossible condition. It's impossible. They'll be around. They will be around forever. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you that because of your mercy, that you will be around forever too. Because you brought us in when the most heavily invited guests of the feast just couldn't bring themselves to it. And I'm sad for them, but I'm so happy for us. I'm so glad that we have a new covenant that we all get to live under. In Jesus' name, you've written your law in our hearts. You've given us the knowledge of God that cannot be taken away from us. The least Christian knows you. There is no hierarchy here. And this forgiveness, which is astonishing. There's sins and iniquities I will not even remember anymore. And I'll forgive all their sins. Oh God, we bless and worship you. No wonder we worship you every time we get together. In Jesus' name, amen.